Welcome to the 360 Sports Network, otherwise known as 3SN. Tonight we're going to be discussing the upcoming NFL Draft. I'm Greg Bichero, and with me tonight is Alex DeLaverson and James Dotson. Gentlemen, how goes it out there? It's going well out here, ready to talk some NFL and not have to worry about collective bargaining agreements. That's it. Alex, how about yourself? I'm doing well, just hanging in there. There you go. Well, to get things started here, because we do have a lot on our plate tonight, we're going to go team by team and discuss uh, the art picks for the 2011 NFL Draft. Now, going first on the clock are the Carolina Panthers. Now, everybody out there is stating that Carolina is going to uh, pick up uh, Cam Newton. I, however, disagree with that. I believe Carolina will pick up a defensive end and pass rusher. With that said, somebody along the lines of Nick Fairley or Declan Bowers from Clemson, Nick Fairley, of course, being from Auburn, I think is going to fit the bill for the Carolina Panthers. The reason why I'm saying this is Ron Rivera, their new head coach, was the former defensive coordinator for the San Diego Chargers. And with that said, I really believe that... Uh, He's going to follow the motto that defenses win championships, and he's going to build a team around a strong defense. So that's why I'm leaning toward um, Cam Newton not going to the Carolina Panthers, or Blaine Gabbard for that matter, but Nick Fairley or uh, Daquan Bowers uh, in that particular role itself. Number two on the clock, we have uh, the Denver Broncos. And because Denver finished dead last in the NFL, with only 23 sacks, I see Denver going after a player that will show up their defense. And the person that I see is Marcel Darius, uh, who's the defensive tackle from Alabama. Uh, Denver is going to be moving back to the 4-3 defense, which will put a spotlight on the very talented pass rusher that Marcel Darius is. Now, the Buffalo Bills are third on the clock. Um, I believe are going to pick Patrick Peterson, the quarterback from LSU. Now, Here's the thing about Buffalo. They don't necessarily need a cornerback, but this is the best all-around defensive athlete out there. At 219 pounds and over 6 feet tall, he's quite durable, and he'll definitely help Buffalo secure their defense and help give them an identity that they have been sorely lacking. Number four are the Cincinnati Bengals in the draft order. And while the Cincinnati Bengals have their definite woes with Carson Palmer threatening to bolt at any given time, and of course they're having their issues with their uh, with their wide receivers. Now, Mike Brown, the owner of the Cincinnati Bengals, loves quarterbacks almost as much as John Gruden does. And it's kind of a coincidence that he hired Jay Gruden to run the offense out there. So I actually see Blaine Gabbert, the quarterback from Missouri, in a Bengals uniform. The kid is pro-ready, he's got great skills, runs the West Coast offense beautifully, and he's most ready. He's the most ready quarterback, that is, to start in the NFL right out of this particular draft. And um, so I, I, I'm going to say that we're going to see a Gabbert era in Cincinnati. And our number five, person, number five team on the clock are the Arizona Cardinals. Um, with the coaching brain trust of the Cardinals being a chip off the old Pittsburgh block, I'm thinking that Ken Wisenhunt is going to pick uh, outside linebacker Vaughn Miller from Texas A&M uh, to solidify uh, Arizona's defense. Vaughn Miller is a wickedly quick player and can do it all, batting down passes to sacking quarterbacks, and he's basically your ultimate defensive utility player. So those are my first five picks coming right off the top. Um, James, why don't you go ahead and give your picks? Well, I'm very similar to what you're looking at, Greg. I think Carolina, right off the top, um, definitely is going to go defense first. Um, I think they're going to go with Nick Fairley over Daquan Bowers. Uh, Nick Fairley's had a great pro day. Everybody was looking at him, and he's just shot up the charts. Um, I think Carolina's main issue is since they lost Julius Peppers, they have not been the Carolina team of old. And I think Nick Fairley is going to be their uh, strong force up front to try to bring back the Carolina Panther days of old. Um, with the Broncos at number two, you said it perfectly. They had a very struggling defense, only 23 sacks. 
But as much as anything, their pass defense wasn't too solid either. And I think having such a great athlete as Patrick Patterson from LSU, I think that it's going to be tough for Denver to look past him, especially if Nick Fairley goes number one. Um, at the number three pick with Buffalo Bills, I think they're going to go with uh, Marcel Darius, who is considered by most to be the number one prospect in this draft. Um, I, I agree with you. If Patterson is still there from LSU, I think that they would go with him. But like you said, they don't need a cornerback. They definitely need some help on the defensive line and linebacker position. And Marcel Darius would be a great, great start to try to shore up that uh, intermediate pass and run game defense. Uh, Cincinnati, you hit it dead on. Blaine Gabbert, he's going to go from from uh, being a Tiger to a Bengal, and that's all because Carson Palmer is getting out of Cincinnati as quickly as he can, and honestly, I can't blame him at all. Um, before the Palmer incident, I was looking at them possibly going with uh, Julio Jones or A.J. Green here at this pick to uh, get another great weapon out there for Carson, but seeing as Palmer is probably uh, jumping ship, I think that... Uh, they're, they have to look to their draft here, and Blaine Gabbert is by far the best choice, in my opinion, for them. And then finally, at number five, um, I think you got it right again, Greg. Vaughn Miller has come out of nowhere. Um, he is actually rated by, um, by most scouts as the number two prospect in this draft. And again, you're looking at uh, Ken Wisenhunt uh, thinking with the Pittsburgh mindset of uh, solidifying a defense, especially when even just two years out of a, a Super Bowl bid, there's still a very, very weak defense in terms of stopping the run, especially. So Vaughn Miller should be a, uh, a good pick to solidify what we have in the running game out in Arizona. Um, what are you thinking over there, Alex? Uh, how are your picks looking out? Yeah, I have fairly gone to the Panthers. I don't think they're going to get um, Gabbert. They have Claus in, and they got Matt Moore back in 2007. So that doesn't make too much sense to me. I think they're giving Gabbert a look, but I think they're aiming for Fairley. Um, at two, I have Marcel Darius. The Broncos finished dead last in the NFL with 23 sacks. So I think they're going to go after him, and I think they will get him. Of course, their sacks will go up next year when Doomerville comes back. Um, at three, I actually have Cam Newton going to the Bills. The Bills have a habit of telegraphing their picks. Last year, Buddy Nix continuously told the media that he wanted a pass-catching running back. And look what happened. They got C.J. Spiller. So I think they will go after Newton there. Um, I have Patrick Patterson go to the Bengals. I know some people think A.J. Green's going to go to them. Um, you guys think Gabbert's going there. But I don't think they're going to do anything with the quarterback situation until the whole Carson Palmer ordeal's done and settled with. So uh, I have Patterson going there. And at five, just what you guys said, I have Vaughn Miller from Texas A&M. Um, Ken Wisenhunt has been looking at quarterbacks, but I think with his job on the line, he's not going to take a chance with the rookie quarterback. I think he might try and make a trade for Kevin Call, Mark, Mark Bolger, or McNabb. So I have Vaughn Miller going to the Cardinals. Yeah, I agree with you, Alex. I don't think, uh, I don't think the Cardinals are going to do anything. I think they're going to try to appease... Um, Larry Fitzgerald as much as possible. I think you're exactly right. They'll go for free agency trying to pick up Kevin Cobb as their quarterback. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Uh, another uh, person I could see in an Arizona uniform might be Donovan McNabb as well. So, Yeah, depending on what Washington decides to do with their pick at the number 10 spot. Correct. Okay, going into number 6, we have uh, the Cleveland Browns on the clock, and uh, the Cleveland Browns with Mike Holmgren fighting his quarterback in Colt McCoy. I believe Mike Holmgren is going to go out and find a world-class receiver for him to complement his running game. So look for A.J. Green, the wide receiver from Georgia, to be drafted in this position. Uh, this guy is six foot four, very speedy, and while... While A.J. Green was at Georgia, he recorded 166 receptions for 2,619 yards and 23 touchdowns. So I'm looking for Cleveland to definitely go green on that one. Uh, number seven, we've got the San Francisco 49ers. And here's the thing. If Blaine Gabbard does not go to Cincinnati, then I firmly believe that he will go to the 49ers. However, with this said, I still stand by the notion that Gabbard is going to be a Bengals. So this puts San Francisco squarely 
in the realm of picking up a defense uh, to basically help solidify their defense. And I see them drafting an elite quarterback, cornerback that is, uh, Prince of Mukamara from Nebraska, and not from Brunei, but from Nebraska will take that position. Um, the Tennessee Titans coming in eighth uh, in the draft here. Uh, Tennessee needs a field general. Kerry Collins is getting very, very long on the tooth. And I can see Cam Newton, the quarterback from Auburn, fitting the bill quite nicely in Tennessee. Uh, he also will uh, do well with the likes of Kenny Britt and Chris Johnson out there for Tennessee. So I am looking at Cam Newton to be quarterback ready for Tennessee. Uh, number nine, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, with new defensive coordinator Rob Ryan, I believe that he's going to go after a defensive end or an outside linebacker. And Robert Quinn from North Carolina would definitely fit the bill. Now, here's the thing about the Cowboys. They really, really, really want Nick Fairley. And if Nick Fairley does not go number one with Carolina, I could actually see the Cowboys, if he's still around, snapping up Nick Fairley. But uh, with reality being uh, the way that it is, I really think Robert Quinn will fall down to North Carolina, uh, fall down to Dallas from North Carolina. Now, a little bit about Robert Quinn. He was dismissed from the University of North Carolina back in 2010 for accepting $5,600 in benefits. But he's handled himself well. The guy runs a 4840 and uh, definitely a great utility player and definitely somebody that will bring a lot of stability to the Dallas Cowboys defense. And number 10, Washington Redskins. Now, here's the thing. If Cam Newton's there, he will be a Redskin. However... If Cam goes to Tennessee or to another team, uh, the Redskins cannot survive with Rex Grossman at the helm. So I look for Mike Shanahan and his son to go after Jake Locker, the quarterback from Washington. And Locker will not bring the baggage that the free agent quarterbacks out there may possess. And we all know about free agent quarterbacks' baggage and the owner of Mr. Snyder. Uh, they just don't, they don't jive. So I see Jake Locker being uh, the pick at number 10, if Cam Newton is not there, for the Washington Redskins. How about you, James? What do you got there from 6 through 10? Um, well, first looking at what you're, what you're, you've already gotten uh, three quarterbacks going off in the top 10, and I think this could be a sign of things if there is no uh, free agency because of the collective bargaining agreement and just because they don't know what they're going to be able to get if teams can pick up a McNabb or a Kevin Cobb off of free agency, they may have to be a little bit more, uh, say, uh, just a little bit more risky in who they draft, and especially if there ends up being a rookie wage scale, too, that could also help out getting more quarterbacks off the board early. Um, with that being said, looking at number six with Cleveland for me, I definitely agree 100% A.J. Green um, is going to be going to Cleveland Browns. The only issue you see there is between A.J. Green and Julio Jones, where Jones has run faster and has essentially been a bigger playmaker throughout his college career. The The uh, question is, why A.J. Green? And it just seems so far that the Browns and Mike Holmgren have preferred A.J. Green and that uh, the uncertainty with Julio Jones after his broken foot is what gives Green the nod here. And, uh, yeah, Colt McCoy being, it appears, the uh, quarterback of the future in Cleveland. Now they need some wide receivers out there beyond uh, Muhammad Massaqua and Joshua Cribbs and uh, Chance and Stucky. So uh, A.J. Green should be a dominant force right off the bat as soon as he arrives in Cleveland. Um, number seven, San Francisco. I have them going quarterback. I have a feeling that the, uh, that the uh, Alex Smith show is done out there in, in the San Francisco area. And I'm looking at Ryan Mallett from Arkansas. Uh, the six foot seven quarterback is just an absolute beast. He is very much a Ben Roethlisberger type guy, except even bigger and taller. Uh, the only issue that you see here, which is why a lot of teams are starting to shy away from him, it appears, is they say that he's starting to look clumsy and that he doesn't move around the pocket well enough. But I think his pure skill, his great arm, and his size are what are going to keep him as a top 10 quarterback, as a top 10 draft pick, essentially. Um, number eight, I think Tennessee could also definitely use a quarterback at this point. But 
Kerry Collins being the ageless wonder that he is and still hanging in there, um, if if he uh, if he stays in there and who knows what happens with him or Vince Young, I think they can hang out and try to get a later pick for a quarterback or try to pick somebody up in free agency. And I think just at this point, uh, Daquan Bowers will be too too juicy to pass up for them. So they will go with the defensive end from Clemson there. Uh, Dallas at the number nine pick. This is where I think uh, the Prince will fall off the board. Prince Amukamara from Nebraska. Um, the Cowboys have Jenkins as their one true uh, defensive back. Uh, beyond that, they don't have anybody who can really stop the pass out there. And as much as Jerry Jones loves to bring in his skill players, the uh, the Felix Jones type players, I think he's going to have to bring in a playmaker on defense. And this is where he'll bring a prince to be his uh, to be his prince to Jerry Jones the King. And number 10, Washington, the absolute best pick for them is without a doubt Cam Newton. Um, Cam Newton, I think, is absolutely perfect for the Washington system, and you said it best. You do not, if you are a Redskin, you do not want to stick with Rex Grossman out there. So I think right there you're going to have Cam Newton as a perfect selection in the 10th hole for Washington. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see some big things out of Cam Newton and not have him turn into the next Jamarcus Russell of the NFL draft. Uh, Alex, uh, do you have A.J. Green going to Cleveland as well? Yes, I do, just like the both of you. McCoy needs a weapon. And, um, of course, you know, Green could be picked up by the Bengals. But, like I said, I don't think that will be the case. Um, So I do have A.J. Green going to the Browns. You basically covered all the reasons why they'll take him. Um, The Niners, I have them taking. I'm a Camara. Um, The Niners need help at corner. Nate Clemens is due about a little over seven million in seven million in 2011 and nine million in 2012 for a 31 year old declining corner. That's a bit much, and Shante Spencer's kind of inconsistent. So I think they'll go with him. Um, I actually think Blaine Gabbert falls to the Titans. Of course, you know the whole Vince Young, Jeff Fisher debacle. Neither of them are there, so I think they'll pick up Gabbert. He's obviously going to be the best player available at the time. And they need a franchise quarterback. I always believe that's the best way to start a franchise is with their quarterback. Um, as far as the Cowboys go, I have them taking J.J. Watt from Wisconsin. Jay Ratliff and Stephen Bauer figure to start on Dallas' defensive line for a long time. Ratliff will continue to man the nose tackle position, but they're still avoid at right end. So I, so I think J.J. Watt will fill in perfectly there. Um, as far as the Redskins go, I think they take Julio Jones. Um, me personally, I think he's the best wide receiver in the draft. But like I said, I think the Browns will take green. So I think he goes to the Redskins. They're losing Santana Moss, and I think he'll fill in perfectly for him. Hmm. Very interesting picks. All, all sounds good there. Julio Jones at number 10. That could be uh, interesting in Washington. Just who's going to throw the ball to him is the only question. You and Julio down by the schoolyard. Going into uh, the 11th pick in the NFL draft, looking at the Houston Texans up on the board, and Wade Phillips uh, basically just traveled across the state of Texas uh, to take on uh, the defensive role with the Houston Texans. And I look for Wade Phillips to complement his defense with uh, defensive end and outside linebacker Alden Smith from Missouri. Robert Quinn, I think, would be their first choice, but I'm really thinking that this guy's going to be off the board, so Alden Alden Smith will fit nicely in at the outside linebacker package with uh, Houston uh, and also with Carmen Barwin out there, too. Uh, The Minnesota Vikings are the 12th pick in the draft, and Minnesota, right now, needs a good quarterback. With the demise of Brett Favre and the whole program that uh, kind of just went to bust, in a big way, uh, Wes Frazier, I think, is going to set the tempo and basically get a new quarterback, a new regime in town, and I really see Minnesota going after Ryan Mallett, the quarterback from Arkansas. The guy's big, he's durable, he can throw the long ball, and yes, they do have speedy receivers in Minnesota. The Detroit Lions are coming in at number 13. And I think we can all agree that Matt Stafford will not be long in this league without protection. Uh, So this is where Space Invaders come into play, and there's nobody more athletic 
on offensive tackle Tyron Smith from USC. This guy is a load at 307 pounds with uh, 36 and 3 8 inch arms. So I definitely see this guy plugging some holes in that uh, Detroit offensive line. The 14th pick of the NFL draft is going to be the St. Louis Rams. Now, here's the thing. If Julio Jones doesn't get picked earlier by Minnesota, look for him to become a Ram. The St. Louis Rams are woeful at their receiving position last year. Now, Julio Jones at 6'2 has the blocking skills of a Heinz Ward, and he's a speed burner running the 40, running the 40 at 4'4", and he also has a 12-foot broad jump. So this guy's a monster out there, and I see the St. Louis Rams going after him in a big, big way. And number 15 on the board is the Miami Dolphins. Miami's in need of some running talent with Ricky Williams and Ronnie Brown coming up on free agency. Enter Mark Ingram, the running back from Alabama. I really think he will fit the bill nicely in Miami. Ingram is an every down back who's got a running style similar to the great Emmett Smith. So that's uh, 11 through 15. James, uh, where do you weigh in on those? Um, I have Robert Quinn going to Houston at number 11 uh, because I think Dallas and Washington are going to pass up on him. I think Dallas just needs a cornerback too much. So Robert Quinn becomes the perfect pick for Houston, getting that defensive end slash linebacker position um, so that he can do whatever in the 3-4 defense. Um, Minnesota, I see picking J.J. Watt. Uh, like Alex said earlier, uh, Watt's just a strong defensive end from Wisconsin, and I think Minnesota... Um, at this point, there's not too many quarterbacks that uh, fit the bill for Minnesota. So I look at them looking more free agency and going defense instead. Uh, Detroit, um, you, you're exactly right as far as Matt Stafford's concerned. He has missed more games than he's played, it seems. So getting a uh, athletic, strong offensive tackle in Tyron Smith is by far the uh, obvious choice there. Um, I also agree with your St. Louis pick with Julio Jones, and all I have to say is get ready to see the greatest show on turf return. When you have um, Sam Bradford doing as well as he did in his rookie campaign with the receivers that he didn't have, and then you bring in an athlete like Julio Jones, uh, 4-4-40 on a broken foot. I, if that's on a broken foot, I want to see what he can do when he's healthy and on turf. He'll be flying by every defensive back in the league. And then, yeah, Mark Ingram, he will come right into Miami at the fifth pick. And um, Miami is just salivating at the opportunity to get Mark Ingram, I think, here. Um, Ricky Williams is old. It's blunt, but it's true. And Mark Ingram, to get some young legs in that backfield, possibly running some more Wildcat. He did that a lot at Auburn. Or, I'm sorry, did that a lot at Alabama. And I think he can come right in and take over for Ricky Williams and and Ronnie Brown, exactly, on every down or as uh, a specialty back in a Wildcat-type formation. Um, Alex, let's put you back on with Houston. What do you got going on over there? Yeah, just like you have Robert Quinn going to the Texans, with Wade Phillips going to a 3-4, Houston will need a nose tackle to pair with ends Mario Williams and Antonio Smith. So I have Quinn there. Um, I have the Vikings taking Dequan, Dequan Bowers. I know it's kind of... Uh, a drop for him on my board, but I think with his knee injury and him postponing workouts, I think he drops to the Vikings, but I do see the Vikings taking him. Um, and for the Lions, I have Tyron Smith, too. They need to protect Stafford, so it's a big priority to get linemen. In the draft, in the past, they always go after playmakers. Seems like every year they take a wide receiver. I think this year it's different. Um, if... Julio Jones is not available, which I don't think he will be. Um, the Rams would pass on him or not take him and take Alden Smith instead. Chris Long had an incredible season, but the Rams need a pass rusher on the other side of the line of scrimmage. James Hall is also coming off a great year, but he just turned 34, and St. Louis will need to find a long-term successor soon. I think the Dolphins will obviously take Mark Ingram. Um, both Williams and Ronnie Brown are free agents, and neither of them really proved much to me. So I think they go with the franchise running back and Mark Ingram. I would agree with you on that, number 15 with uh, the Miami Dolphins. I think uh, Ricky Williams uh, uh, is pretty much uh, burned out, and uh, I think that's basically... Uh, uh, with him going into free agency, uh, Andrew Mark Ingram, I agree with that pick wholeheartedly there. 
Yeah, I mean, some people have the Dolphins taking a quarterback, but I think it's so obvious that um, Ingram goes to them. And uh, the Dolphins, in, and especially if the Dolphins are interested in Carson Palmer, the quarterback situation could be solved there. Like, I don't think Palmer will... I don't. Palmer's not going to stay in Cincinnati, and Dolphins have expressed interest. So, to me, this seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, the only other issue I see in Miami is they can have the great running back, they can bring in a Carson Palmer, but will their offensive line be able to hold up? It's uh, They haven't had the greatest running numbers the last two years with such a running-heavy offense. So can you blame the offensive line? Do they need to try to youthen up a little bit there, too? Well, I have them, if they don't take Ingram, possibly taking Mike Pouncey, Marquise Pouncey's brother from Florida. So I wouldn't be surprised if they took him, but I don't think he'll go that early. But it's a thought. It's possible. The 16th pick of the 2011 NFL draft are the Jacksonville Jaguars. And Jacksonville definitely needs help at the defensive end position. And with that said, general manager Gene Smith is going to look for somebody with a pedigree and a good work ethic. Uh, Cameron Jordan, the defensive end from California, fits this bill quite nicely. Uh, Cam Jordan is the son of the NFL great Steve Jordan. This kid's grown up with football and has and is a talented five-technique player who stood out in the senior bowl. So this is a guy that can definitely fit right into the Jacksonville Jaguars defensive mentality with Jack Del Rio at the helm. I really see Jacksonville going after, um, going after Cam Jordan. Now, the uh, New England Patriots. Uh, Bill Belichick coming in at the, the 17th pick of the draft. Belichick loves team players. This guy's a no-nonsense coach. Uh, he stresses teamwork in every which way possible. So with all this said, I really think New England's going to look to upgrade their defensive end position. So I look for the Patriots to pick up Ryan Kerrigan, the defensive end from Purdue. Now, this guy is a class act. He served as team captain for the Boilermakers. This guy's got no character concerns. He was a three-year starter and an academic All-American, and this guy's got a blue-collar, hard-nosed attitude, very disciplined player. I see Kerrigan as a New England Patriot. The 18th uh, pick of the 2011 draft, uh, the San Diego Chargers. The Chargers' defense needs help. With Jock Cesare as a free agent this year, I look for San Diego to go after Muhammad Wilkerson, the defensive tackle from Temple. Uh, Wilkerson is six foot five, three hundred five pounds. This guy's a run stuffer, and he's got fantastic pass rushing capabilities. So I'm looking at Wilkerson, the defensive tackle from Temple, to go to San Diego. The 19th pick are the New York Giants and Eli Manning's success depends upon protection. William Beatty is struggling at left tackle, and the Giants are going to need to improve that offensive line, and I see them doing this by drafting Anthony Costanzo, the offensive tackle from Boston College. Costanzo showed up well in the combine and has demonstrated athleticism, and, yes, he is from Boston College, where, of course, their head coach got started. So I really see that Boston College connection going on there and then picking Anthony Costanzo at offensive tackle. And number 20th, the 20th pick of the NFL draft, I see Tampa Bay, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, Tampa Bay needs help in the linebacker position. Akeem Ayers, the outside linebacker from UCLA, or Adrian Claiborne would fit very well here. Now, Claiborne did not have a great 2010 season compared to his junior season, but he performed very well in the combine. And, of course, Akeem Ayers is a great physical specimen who's familiar with both the 3-4 and the 4-3, and either one of those two will fit the bill in Tampa quite nicely, basically solidifying a very, very stout Tampa Bay defense. James, where are you at on these? Um, I agree with your first couple picks. I definitely think Jacksonville, New England, San Diego all stay on the defensive line. Um, I instead, though, I think Ryan Kerrigan goes to Jacksonville with the number 16 pick overall. I, I just think he is too solid and too good of a player for Jacksonville to pass up at this point. Um, Cam Jordan is a, is a solid player as well. I just think Ryan Kerrigan is the better, uh, better pick for them at this point. Uh, New England with the 17th pick on the clock. Um, they got this pick from Oakland from uh, when they had to trade, when uh, Oakland traded for Richard Seymour. Yeah, that really paid off, didn't it? 
um, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they, they too will uh, go defensive line. They will go with Adrian Claiborne, though, is who I think they will pick up the defensive end from Iowa. I've had to watch this guy play for the last three years here in Big Ten country, and I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to be facing up against him. That being said, though, I New England, you know how they are with trading draft picks for future draft picks, so it would not surprise me if, especially when they have two picks here in the first round, with here the number 17 pick and the number 27 pick overall, that they would trade away one of them to try to get a couple other uh, draft picks later on, especially when they can only trade draft picks this year and not trade players during the NFL draft. Um, on the clock at number 18, San Diego. Again, I believe another defensive end. This is where I think Cam Jordan will fall. Again, best defensive end, best defensive lineman here at the board. Uh, for San Diego, they will go with Cam Jordan, the defensive end from California. Uh, the New York Giants, I also agree they will go with an offensive tackle here. I like the uh, Anthony Costanzo pick from Boston College, but again, I just think that if you look by pure talent, I think that uh, Nate Solder from Colorado is a great uh, blindside type uh, protector, and Eli Manning just has not been the Eli Manning that he could and should be, even though when he puts up those great stats, he has too many games where he's falling flat on his face, too. And I think shoring up the offensive line will be able to give him more time to throw it to all of his weapons when she has plenty of them out there in the Meadowlands. And then rounding up the top 20, Tampa Bay is a very young team, and to perform as well as they have done these past couple of years with the young talent that they have, it makes me scared for what they could be in the future. Uh, they're one, I don't even know if you could call it a weak point. They're not weak in any position, I don't think. But I think they can sure up the uh, defensive end or linebacker position. Um, I can see him going with Akeem Ayers here. Um, I can see him going with Alden Smith, the defensive end from Missouri, too. And I think just by going from pure talent off of, off of the board, if you go by the best available principle, which is, I think, what Tampa Bay will do when they are so balanced on the defensive front especially, I think they will go with Alden Smith, the defensive end from Missouri. Um, let's move it back to Alex with the number 16 pick in Jacksonville back on the clock. Yeah, I have Ryan Kerrigan going to the Jags. He fills a team need. The Jaguars had just three sacks in their final five games. Aaron Kamen's coming off uh, his second ACL tear in two years, so I think he fits in there pretty well. Um, for my number 17 pick, I have Cameron Jordan going to the Patriots. He's arguably the best talent available. He had an incredible season with 12 and a half sacks, or 12 and a half tackles and five and a half sacks. He had a great combine, so I think he goes to the Patriots. Um, at 18, I have Muhammad Wilkerson from Temple. His stock's on the rise. Some have him going to New England, um, but I think he'll end up falling to the, uh, to the Chargers. At number 19, I have Anthony Costanzo from Boston College. The Giants need the left tackle of the future because William Betty has struggled this far in his brief career, and I think he fills in, fills in well there. And I have Adrian Claiborne going to the Bucks. I know he has some character issues, but I think he'll be the best player available for the Bucks to take, take at that time. Coming in on the 21st pick of the 2011 draft, we've got the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, part of the Chiefs' success this past season was Jamal Charles. Now, Kansas City will continue their ground assault by shoring up its trenches. This is where I see Gabe Karimi coming into the rescue here. Gabe Karimi, the offensive tackle from Wisconsin, will shore up this tackle position. He comes from a pro-style offense at Wisconsin where he was a four-year starter. He also had a very solid combine and was the 2010 Outland Trophy winner. So, Karimi going to the Chiefs. Uh, at the 22 spot with the Indianapolis Colts, Peyton Manning needs upgraded pass protection as demonstrated last year by the back-to-back -back debacles of the Chargers game and the Cowboys game that following week. So I look for Indy to pick up Nate Solder, the offensive tackle from Colorado. Solder had a great senior bowl and combine performance and is drawing comparisons right now to the great Tony Baselli. So I've got Nate Solder going to the Colts. In the 23 position with the Philadelphia Eagles, Philadelphia's most glaring weakness last year was their offensive line, where the Eagles allowed 52 sacks 
last year. Imagine, 52 sacks. They were going to want to protect Michael Vick a little bit better so that Vick can actually show that magic that he actually has. So what better way to fill this void than with uh, offensive guard or center Mike Pouncey from Florida? Uh, Pouncey is versatile, quick, has all the instincts that his twin brother has in Pittsburgh, and he will definitely be an upgrade to that Philadelphia line. And uh, this guy, you can plug him in anywhere, and he'll be a gamer. So I see Mike Pouncey going to the Philadelphia Eagles. Coming in at the number 24 uh, spot, we have the New Orleans Saints. Now, Cameron Hayward, the defensive end from Ohio State, I really believe will be picked up by the New Orleans Saints as he is a terrific fit for the Greg Williams-style defense that's out there. This guy is 6'5", 294 pounds, and he is a bruiser. He's able to apply the pressure during the pass rush that did not occur regularly last year. Now, here's a note for all you Pitt fans that are out there. Cameron Hayward's dad is the late Craig Ironhead Hayward, who played for the Pitt Panthers, and who also played for the New Orleans Saints. So that's why I really see Cameron Hayward basically having almost a homecoming with the New Orleans Saints. And at the number 25 uh, spot, we've got the Seattle Seahawks. Now, Seattle had an atrocious, atrocious backfield last year. So look for Seattle to draft a top-flight cornerback, such as Brandon Harris from Miami, or even Jimmy Smith from Colorado. Now, Jimmy Smith is a better talent, and this guy, uh, if he didn't have the character issues out there, would probably be a top 10 pick. But because this guy had character issues surrounding drugs and two arrests while well, Colorado and downplaying his arrest and the criminal record, uh, this guy could fall as low as number 25 out there. And if he's out there, I see the Seattle Seahawks maybe taking a gamble on that. Pete Carroll has taken uh, risks uh, before with some players like that. So uh, it will either be Brandon Harris from Miami or Jimmy Smith from Colorado, both top-flight quarterbacks to fill the backfield needs at Seattle. James, what do you think on these? Um, I think that your picks are looking pretty solid and at this point in the draft you've got a lot of uh, needs being filled by these uh, lower level playoff teams um, starting with Kansas City I think well they could go pretty much anywhere in on defense to to uh, sure up what was a very uh, poor performance in their playoff game against Baltimore um, I see them going with Akeem Ayers just an all-around good athlete uh, the linebacker from UCLA I think he can fill multiple needs and just is a solid pick for them at that spot. Indianapolis, they need to protect Peyton Manning, pure and simple. He was on his backside way too much last year. And this is where I think you see Anthony Costanzo from Boston College falling off the board. I just to sure up that offensive line and maybe even bring a running game back to Indianapolis. I doubt it, but it's worth a shot. Uh, Philadelphia uh, they will also go with offensive line. They let Mike Vick get punished way too much, like you said. This is where I think Gabe Karimi, the offensive tackle from Wisconsin, will go off the board. Uh, Four-year starter at a pro-style offense of Wisconsin, like you said, there's no way that Philadelphia can pass him up at this position. Um, at the number 24 spot, the New Orleans Saints, they will go with defensive end Muhammad Wilkerson, the defensive end from Temple. And the reason that they're going to look at this uh, this position, just look at what Seattle and their really bad, bad, bad running offense did against them in the playoff game last year. If they can score 41 points on New Orleans defense with Seattle having a losing record, New Orleans needs to do something to sure up that defense. Drew Brees is fine on the offense. They need to sure up the running game. Muhammad Wilkerson will fill everything up in the middle. And then finally at the... Uh, 25 pick Seattle, which is shocking with their record that they can be that late in the draft. Um, Hasselbeck's too old. I think they're going to stay in state, though. I think they're going to pick up quarterback Jake Locker from Washington. I think he'll be falling way off the board, um, or I'm sorry, falling way down the board compared to where the other quarterbacks are. I can also see Seattle possibly trading up to get him a little bit earlier with fear of a couple other teams possibly taking him. But Jake Locker is not going to have to travel far to go from uh, Washington to his new home with Pete Carroll in Seattle. Well, I have Phil Taylor, nose tackle from Baylor, going to the Chiefs. The Chiefs struggled against the run late in the year because they had nothing at the nose tackle position. 
Phil Taylor would remedy that issue. Um, I have Nate Solder from Colorado going to the Colts. Like you guys said, Manning was on his rear end um, so many times. It was especially evident against the Chargers on a Sunday night game. The Cowboys the following week, so it only makes sense to draft him. Um, I have the Eagles taking Gabe Karami from Wisconsin. They surrendered 52 sacks this year, including six in that weird Tuesday night, Tuesday night game against the Vikings. So I think he'll, he'll get picked up by the Eagles there. I have the Saints taking Brooks Reed, the defensive end from Arizona. The Saints don't have many holes on their roster, but they could certainly use some upgrades on the defensive front. I think they'll take the best pass rusher available. And the Seahawks have Jimmy Smith, from cornerback from Colorado, getting picked up by the Seahawks. They need some help with their atrocious pass defense, especially with Kelly Jennings heading for free agency this March, so I think that's a logical selection. I like looking at New Orleans here. We each have them looking at a uh, defensive end at some sort of pass rusher, but I like how you have we have three different styles represented here. You have a big guy in Muhammad Wilkerson. you got Cameron, Cameron Haywood, who is a great pass rusher but can drop back into coverage, and Brooks Reed, who can do just about everything in Arizona. So I think that shows that New Orleans really could go in any direction, but they need to go in some direction with that defensive line. I also like uh, Nate Solder, the offensive tackle from Colorado with the Colts. And Alex, I can't agree with you more on that guy. This guy, uh, he, he's a load and he will definitely plug some holes. And uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying there as well. Uh, Indianapolis definitely needs to fix their line. Yeah, I mean, it was just pretty pathetic, those two games. And then they'll, they'll get better. I really like Solder a lot, just like you said. Yeah, and plus he had a great senior bowl combine performance. And this guy, I mean, he fits the Indianapolis mold to a T. I mean, there are certain players that are almost like born to play for certain teams, it seems. And Solder definitely looks like that type of player that will fit in Indianapolis quite well. It's just hoping that he's still there on the board when the, when the Colts are on the clock. Yeah. yeah. The 26th pick of the NFL draft, uh, looking at the Baltimore Ravens. Now, the Ravens have two issues they need to deal with an aging defense, and a disappointing wide receiver pickup in Anquan Bolden. Now, I believe the Ravens are going to address their defensive issue first by taking care of a problem that they have with their corners. Look for Brandon Harris or Jimmy Smith to end up in Baltimore with Chris Carr, Fabian Washington, and Josh Wilson all being free agents this year. So I really see the Ravens showing up the corner position by going after either Brandon Harris or Jimmy Smith. Now, the Atlanta Falcons are coming in at the 27th pick. The Falcons need help at the wide receiver position in a very big way. Tight end Tony Gonzalez regressed horribly last year, leaving Matt Ryan with only Roddy White as his most dependable target. So I look for Atlanta to go after Torrey Smith, the wide receiver from Maryland. Now, nice thing about Torrey Smith, this guy runs a 4-3-7-40, and he's got a 41-inch vertical jump. So the... Uh, uh, Matty Ice down there is going to be licking his chops if they get uh, if they get uh, Torrey Smith there from Maryland. Now, the New England Patriots are coming in at number 28. Now, the Patriots are going to take their second first-round pick to take care of protection issues for Tom Brady. With Stephen Neal retiring, the Pats will either pick up a guard or a tackle. I see Derek Sherrod, the offensive tackle from Mississippi State, going over there to the Patriots. I'm also very high in the Patriots' rate where we got Mike Pouncey. So if Mike Pouncey's uh, still available, if he does not go to the Eagles, the New England Patriots are definitely, definitely looking very closely at Mike Pouncey. And the 29th position, we have the we have the Chicago Bears. Now the Bears need to give Jay Cutler a lot more protection. And with that said, look for Chicago to go after Rodney Hudson, uh, the guard from Florida State. Now this guy is a load at 299 pounds and can, and, and can be an immediate upgrade for Chicago's very porous offensive line. And at the number 30 position in the NFL draft, we've got Rex Ryan's New York Jets. Now, given the mindset of Rex Ryan, I believe he'll continue to upgrade the defensive cores by going after speed in the defensive end and outside linebacker position. So Brooks Reed fits the bill nicely. That's the defensive end and outside linebacker from Arizona. Uh, he ran the fastest 10-yard split of the defensive lineman in the combine and has been compared to Clay Matthews of Green Bay. And we all know what Clay Matthews did in the Super Bowl. 
Uh, so I really see Rex Ryan picking up Brooks Reed. What do you think out there, James? Um, starting with the number 26 pick in Baltimore, I think, yeah, their defense is just getting too old that they will definitely go cornerback. Um, I still see Jimmy Smith and um, Brandon Haywood's. Brandon Harris still available at this point, and I think Baltimore will take the better player in Jimmy Smith. Um, they're not worried about character issues. Uh, you can tell from the players that they already have on their roster that character is not an issue for the Baltimore Ravens. As long as they play, they're fine with them. Um, Atlanta, I think you're exactly right. They can look at wide receiver. Torrey Smith is a good pick here. Uh, John Baldwin would be a possibility here from Pitt. I actually look at them... Um, not replacing Tony Gonzalez, but adding a second tight end in Kyle Rudolph from Notre Dame coming at this position. Just because Kyle Rudolph can line up as a tight end or he can play as a slot position and essentially be an extra wide receiver. It will give him some versatility in their offense, in their formations, and I think he is a young Tony Gonzalez. He is very similar in style and style of play and in just the way that he, um, just in his build itself. So I think Kyle Rudolph is a perfect fit um, to be receiving targets from Matty Ice down there. Um, New England, again, if, this is a big if, uh, they decide to keep both of their picks, I agree that they will try to shore up the offensive line here. Um, I look at them going for the offensive lineman Danny Watkins from Baylor to try to shore up that uh, interior line. Um, I know they're looking at Mike Pouncey, but I think, just, I don't know, he, they're looking at him hard. I just feel that Danny Watkins is a better pick, and it sounds to me from everything that we've seen over the years that they will take the best player available. That's the uh, Bill Belichick way. So that's I'm looking at Watkins there. Uh, Chicago, they need to sure up their offensive line big time, but they're still Chicago. They're still defense first. And with that in mind, I think they take uh, Corey Luguette from Illinois, the defensive tackle. Um, he's a... Uh, beast on the inside, and I think that can sure up the interior line for Chicago and keep their uh, run-stopping defense at the top of the field. As for the New York Jets, they can go just about anywhere. I mean, they don't have many um, insane playmakers on the offense. Some big names, yes, but nobody who's really uh, stepping up as far as uh, making the big plays week in, week out. Um, I still think, though, that they will end up trying to solidify their defense. I can see them going with the Phil Taylor, defensive tackle from Baylor, but I really think in the end that they will go with Cameron Haywood, uh, defensive end from Ohio State at this point. Um, I just think that he is the best pick for the Jets and with Rex Ryan and his defense just to try to solidify everything. Um, what do you think, Alex? Everything looking good over there? Well, I have Derek Sherrod, offensive tackle from Mississippi State, going to the Ravens. The Ravens met with Sherrod at the Senior Bowl and Combine. They're obviously interested in him and will probably select the athletic left tackle prospect if he's available. So, like I said, I think he'll fall there. I have Justin Houston, defensive end from Georgia, going to the Falcons. The Falcons really need to upgrade their pass rush. They just had 31 sacks during the regular season, and John Abraham is not getting any younger. Um, I have Mike Pouncey going to the Patriots. They are really interested in Pouncey. That's all I've been hearing lately. Is they keep looking at him. They're very interested. They're very big and high on him. So if yeah, if they don't trade away that pick, I think he will go to the Patriots. And but of course that's a big if. Um, I have Corey Leggett, defensive tackle from Illinois, going to the Bears. Um, the the Bears can't upgrade their offensive front because all the first round prospects are going to be off the board. Um, they could reach for Stefan Wisniewski from Penn State, but like you said, they might as well wait till next round. They are the defensive bears, and that's what they'll go with. Um, I have Cameron Hayward, defensive end from Ohio State, going to the Jets. Um, it never hurts to have as many quality pass rushers as possible when you have to go through Tom Brady, Manning, and Roethlisberger every year to get to the Super Bowl. So to me, that seems like a logical choice. Uh, yeah, Alex, I have to agree with you about uh, Cam Hayward here. Because, uh, you know, this guy, if he doesn't end up in New Orleans, so this guy is a Rex Ryan-style player. He's big, he's brash, he can really make things happen. So if Hayward does not end up in New Orleans, the Jets, I see, have been picking him up. Yeah, and definitely. And I think, um, looking back real quick at the Chicago, um, I could see them going with a stretch at someone like Stefan Wisniewski, but 
Uh, I think they're they have a better chance of possibly trading up in the second round to get a good quality uh, offensive lineman in the early second round. And with uh, Corey Leggett being a top 15 prospect, according to most of the uh, draft analysts, I just don't see how Chicago and their defensive-minded scheme could let this guy pass. Rounding out the last two spots, we have our AFC champions, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, I see, it coming in at number 31, have two issues they have to deal with. Offense and defense, just to put it bluntly. Uh, Pittsburgh's offensive line, more specifically, is patchwork at best, and I believe that this is their biggest concern. And with all this said, I look for the Steelers to pick up an offensive tackle. Now, Pittsburgh has been very high on Derek Sherrod. He's the offensive tackle from Mississippi State. Now, this guy is a pure left tackle that looks NFL ready to play day one. Now, we all, we all saw what was going on with Flozell Adams and the injuries that Flozell Adams had and uh, the challenges that he had playing at the left tackle position. So I really see Derek Sherrod fitting in very nicely if he's still around at the number 31 position. Now, defensively, if Sherrod is not available, I see them going after Martez Wilson from Illinois. And this guy is a very intriguing pick because this guy is an interior linebacker. Uh, he's very fast. He's got, he runs a 4 4 4 40. He's got a 36 inch vertical jump, and speed at the defensive post is a plus. And this guy can definitely help the aging defensive core, especially whenever you have the Steelers' uh, three linebackers, Ferrier, Foot, Harrison, all in their uh, either early 30s or mid 30s. It's, a, it's time, I think, that Pittsburgh gets a little bit of use in there. So. Those are what I'm looking at for Pittsburgh, either one or the other. And the last pick of the first round, we have the Green Bay Packers weighing in. I look for Green Bay to get more receivers for Aaron Rodgers. Uh, John Baldwin, I think, would be a perfect fit out there. He's a wide receiver from the University of Pittsburgh. He shows a tremendous amount of promise. Uh, this guy will definitely help with uh, the aging of Donald Driver, and James Jones uh, will soon be leaving to become a free agent. And I really see John Baldwin as a nice counterpart to Greg Jennings out there in Green Bay. So how about you, James? Where, where do you see these at? Um, you got it perfect with Pittsburgh. They need to solidify the offensive line. They need to solidify the defensive, the defensive backfield. And that can't be more obvious than after watching Aaron Rodgers absolutely demolish the Steel Curtain defensive backs uh, time and time again. It, it was playing pitch and catch out there. There was there was nothing stopping him out there. Um, so I think they definitely go cornerback unless Mike Pouncey is still on the board. I think it is going to be with, with the success that Morquise has had in his in his rookie year for the Steelers. I don't know how they could pass up his twin to be able to solidify the offensive line even more, get the Pouncey twins up front, and hopefully have a solid offensive line for a good number of years with the two guys from Florida. So if Pouncey is available, I think they definitely go there. Otherwise, I think they have to look cornerback and nowhere else. They need to solidify that before anything else. As for the Packers, um, I, I like the John Baldwin idea. I think that that could be a possibility. But I think just looking straight up when they still have Donald Driver, he is getting old, yes, but he's still there. Jordy Nelson played well. And when they had three different tight ends throughout the year due to injury coming in and virtually playing just fine, especially in, in that system where they can have a tight end block most of the time, I, I the wide receiver need just may not be quite up to par at this point, I don't think. Um, this is where I can see Brooks Reed falling off the board, though, the defensive end linebacker from Arizona. I think that he can just be the uh, counterpart, I guess, on the other side to what Clay Matthews has done. And when you have those two and you have uh, Raji in the middle, I think you can have a very strong defensive front for Green Bay that no team is going to want to be facing. So I think Pouncey for Green Bay, and, or I'm sorry, Pouncey for Pittsburgh and Brooks Reed going to Green Bay to finalize the first round. Um, what do you think, Alex? Does Pittsburgh go offense or defense? Yeah, I have them going defense. I know, Greg, they need to improve their offensive line. But honestly, unless Pouncey's available, I don't see them taking a lineman. I have Aaron Williams, defensive back from Texas, going to them. It's been a whole trend throughout this entire decade with Steelers and their defensive backs. They never 
ever play the pass well. This, even when they're ranked, you know, in the top 15 or whatever, it's so deceiving. They can never play against a good quarterback. Paul Mullen doesn't even play against a good quarterback usually. So I think the most important thing is to get a solid defensive backs in there. But, yeah, they do have to improve their offensive line. So, I, like I said, I have Aaron Williams. And then in the rest of the draft, they could start to build up their linemen and then go back to defensive back. I think this draft for them should almost every other pick be either offensive lineman or defensive back. Um, as far as the Packers go, um, I think they will take Torrey Smith, wide receiver from Maryland, although I would like to see them take John Baldwin. Yeah, he has some character issues, but this guy's a freak. He's 6'5", 230 pounds. Um, the way he can jump, he reminds me, he's like a hybrid, of, of my, in my opinion, of Calvin Johnson and Randy Moss. He can jump like Moss, has the hands like Moss, but he has the size and strength of Calvin Johnson. Yeah, character issues come into play, but I think in this case, the reward is worth the risk. Well, and the way I, I have to agree with you on that, too, and what better place to take somebody with character issues than to put them out there in uh, no man's land up there in Green Bay where there's absolutely nothing going on that could get them into trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Dotson, yeah, Donald Driver will be there next season regarding there is a next season. But, I mean, he's old. they got to worry about the future. And now Baldwin will be able to perform now. So, I mean, yeah, you make a good point there, but like I said, What's what's the difference if you have bad character issues if a guy can't do anything effectively for you? Uh, that's that's very true. I just I just I don't know John Baldwin in a Green Bay Packer uniform. I just I don't see the connection there. I don't uh, I can see Torrey Smith maybe a little bit better, um, but I don't think they would need a speed receiver. If they were to go receiver, it would be someone to give them a red zone threat like John Baldwin. But then again, I don't think you see Baldwin going up there because, frankly, of some of the uh, character issues. just I, Green Bay is not a place where you're going to survive with any sort of character issues at all. So I think that's where Baldwin might get in trouble and have to wait until early second round before hearing his name come off the board. Well, you know what? I mean, people will say uh, character issues with John Baldwin. He's only really had one incident, and that's when he claimed Wallenstad and his staff was trying to prevent him from going to the NFL. I think that was just more of a heat of the moment thing. He was upset over the coaching change, things like that. But to me, that's just one incident. I think he'll be on his best behavior when he gets there. You know, of course, there won't be a. There probably won't be. There probably will be a rookie wage scale, so he won't make as much money. But you would ha have to think he has some brains down there beyond his best behavior. Yeah, well, I think if there is a rookie wage skill, though, that helps all the skill players, especially quarterback, running back, wide out. I mean, we have running one running back going off the board. We all have Mark Ingram going at number 15. If there, if the rookie wage scale is instituted before this draft commences, you will see more running backs in this top 25. You will see at least four or five quarterbacks going, and you'll see a lot more wide receivers than just Torrey Smith and John Baldwin going off the board. Um, you, they don't they don't take risks right now with the salaries that they're getting um, for these rookies coming out of the draft, especially at the skill position. So I think that if this wage skill can get done, this entire draft could be completely shuffled around. Well, I have to agree with you partially, James, but also disagree with you. Uh, I agree with you, yes, that there definitely needs to be a rookie wage scale, but there aren't that many talented running backs right now to go uh, you know, definitely like that. I mean, uh, Mark Ingram basically you know, stands out because uh, there really isn't that many good guys out there, uh, rookie wage scale uh, regardless. So. Uh, I do have to disagree with that to a certain extent. The skilled player positions itself, there really isn't that many. There's, this this is a draft. You have basically four, you know, let's put it this way, you have four quarterbacks, two and a half are decent. The other two, uh, well, okay. And uh, then you have, uh, this is basically a draft for offensive tackles and defensive ends and uh, linebackers, to be honest with you here. Well, I think you can make the case that, um, like basically what Dotson says, you know, the wage scale could help quarterbacks. You could think think to yourselves, maybe owners won't be so afraid to invest a first round pick and uh, a quarterback, because obviously you have your Jamarcus Russells and your Ryan Leafs. But if you know, if there isn't that big of a financial penalty, maybe they won't be afraid to take a risky player like that. Maybe that that's what makes the Panthers take Blaine Gabbert. Of course, I would screw up my whole draft, but I mean, I think it's something to consider. Yeah, you. I think we have 
Greg, you had three quarterbacks going in the top ten. That was the most out of the three of us. I think you could see all three quarterbacks going, all three of those quarterbacks in Blaine Gabbert, Cam Newton, Jake Locker. You could see those three going one, two, three, one, two, four, two, three, four, very easily, just it, only because teams don't have to worry about the Ryan Leaf syndrome in this in this scenario. And when you have um, Sam Bradford last year, pretty much making as much money off, off his draft salary as Peyton Manning and Tom Brady you know you're getting into some trouble, which is why I think the rookie wage scale could be good. But then, yeah, you're going to get uh, the lower teams go ahead and taking a chance on some of these uh, rookie quarterbacks a lot easier. Yeah, you do make a point there. It, it, it makes it interesting, though, because that could change up the whole style of this draft. Because, yeah, you you got it exactly right. There are really not many good running backs out there. But I, think, when... I think Ingram's the only one I think all of us have in the first round. Oh, yeah. You know, What's really interesting is none of us actually picked any tight ends. Um, yeah, I have I have Kyle Rudolph, who is technically a tight end, going to Atlanta um, at, okay. the, at the 27 pick, but I don't even know if you can call him a tight end. And, yeah, you're right. Normally you see one or two falling off the board early. Yeah, I mean, I have a few tight ends in there somewhere as possible um, picks if mines don't follow through. But, yeah, this isn't that sh- – this – round isn't going to be that strong on tight ends. I'd be very shocked if one gets drafted in the first round. Uh, I think one of the issues with that, too, is the style of offense that you're starting to see more and more of in the NFL. You're seeing more teams start to spread it out a little bit more. Uh, you're seeing shotgun a, a lot more often, and the tight end position is becoming a lost art. I mean, look at the top tight ends in the NFL right now. You have Dallas Clark. You have Antonio Gates. You have even um, Tony Gonzalez. Those are probably three of your top ones, maybe you throw in a Vernon Davis in there possibly. All four of those guys probably line up in the slot as much as they line up at the pure tight end position. That just shows you what the tight end position is starting to become in the NFL. And some teams, or either you have that kind or you have a guy who stays in and block the whole time. There's really not much of a mid zone for that anymore. Well, and, and I have to agree with you to a certain extent there, too. The tight end is basically used in the under game where you have the possession receivers that uh, basically try to stretch the field a little bit. Uh, Heath Miller was a perfect example of uh, using uh, the tight end on the under game. The other type of uh, tight end, too, would be Jacob Tammy, uh, who is mm-hmm. Dallas Clark's understudy. Uh, they played that under game with Jacob Tammy, Dallas Clark, or whoever else they could put into that position in, in Indianapolis. And, of course, you know, you can also make the argument that Wes Welker was almost a pseudo tight end the way he played up there in New England. No, very much so. And, I mean, yeah, if it wasn't for his size, yeah, he he played the tight end position in the slot, which is the, the exact same thing you see from Indianapolis with Tammy and Clark, except that... They it's just are as big. Right, right. Interesting. I think, I think one thing that's on everyone's mind is how that, um, now that the fact that pl- teams cannot trade players for picks, if that's going to have an effect on the draft at all. I think it will. I think this makes it a very plain, a very vanilla draft, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's going to make things interesting, but yeah, because you always see New England on the clock. Oh, New England has traded their pick, so who do exactly. they pick up? Um so the question is, can Bill Belichick do it as often as he has before when all he can do is trade future draft picks? Knowing him, he'll find a way. Oh, yeah, even when it's not allowed, he'll still find a way. It's him. <laughs> yeah, he'll make it happen, right? One way or the other, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see this draft uh, not so much as a vanilla draft, but one for football diehards to savor. I mean, the, the meat and potatoes is on the, is on the line itself. It's in the trenches. And uh, as somebody that just loves watching the trenches play, you know, this is, you definitely have got some fantastic talent out there uh, that can actually turn, you know, entire seasons around. I mean, we, you could actually say that Seattle's season was turned around by the play that they had in the trenches. That's why they, you know, they, they, they're drafting, you know, in the, uh, with the playoff teams, you know, because of the fact that uh, they were able to secure that, you know, their, their offensive line. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I definitely see this type of thing uh, as a very exciting draft, uh, very heavy in the uh, in the tackles and in the defensive ends and the 
uh, this is this is definitely going to be truly a special draft, I think. As, as long as uh, fans don't get disappointed at the fact that they that they aren't seeing the big college playmakers and the the uh, guys that they see going out for the Heisman Trophy every year, that that's the only issue that I that I could ever see it, as far as this. But yeah, you're right. The true football fans will see this for what it is: a great draft full of great players um, and. I mean, the game starts with the center's hand on a ball, and the trenches is where games are won and lost um, when you well, don't have a kicker having to kick at the end. Well, I mean, I wasn't trying to say this is not a good draft for great players. What I'm trying to say is now that, you know, there won't be much trading going on, I think this is a very predictable draft. I don't think there won't – I don't think there's going to be much shuffling. Um, of course, you know, I think if Gabber goes number one, that somewhat screws up our draft, you know, completely. So, like – I haven't fallen to eight, but, you know, if he goes number one, then who knows what will happen. But, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, you know, a you great class. Up, you bring up a really interesting point here, Alex, if Gabbert goes number one. Uh, and none of us, I think, brought up the fact that Gabbert would be going number one. Um, I, I did, really just... but, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, I have Clawson and more. I don't think it makes sense. Yeah, they, I believe they still have uh, Tony Pike from... Uh... From Cincinnati, too. I mean, they have a lot of options that they can exercise out there first. I don't think they're going to give up on their quarterbacks after just one year. Mm-hmm. I mean, but yeah, if they do, I mean, where does that leave everybody else? I mean, if if Nick Fairley or Daquan Powers don't go first, I mean, you could see him drop all the way to eight or nine before before one or the other goes. So, and yeah, where does that where does that end up with uh, Patterson? We each have we all have Patterson going in the top four. Does that push him down further? If there's a quarterback rush at the beginning, do all do we see uh, three or four quarterbacks go in the top five? I, I think there's a lot of questionable uh, possibilities here. It all starts with that first pick. That's it. Yeah. Well, and here's the question. We've seen it a lot lately. Will Carolina make their first pick known ahead of time again, like you've seen teams do over the past few years? Well, I mean, that does leave more, you know, more speculation that Gabbert could go number one. Like, you know, obviously teams usually let you know ahead of time. Last time, I think um, that a team really didn't say they were going to take is when Mario when Mario Williams got drafted by the Texans. Everyone thought it was going to be Bush, and Bush goes to the Saints. So, I mean, this could be that kind of situation. We don't know. I just think at the end of the day, it's just not a smart move. This has been a fantastic roundtable discussion, and... Uh... Uh, we definitely look forward to sitting down and seeing basically who's right, who's wrong, who's wise, who's otherwise uh, come uh, come the NFL draft. And uh, for everybody out there who's tuned in, thank you so much for supporting the 3SN Network. And uh, we will continue to amaze, dazzle, and feature new and interesting things down the road. So please stay tuned to us. We are here to stay. Thank you, and good night.